Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and Senior English A. And we are now in our Consumable My Perspectives volume number, uh, page number 10. And we're introducing ourselves and providing overview uh, for unit number one. We begin with the essential question, what makes a hero? And on the page 11, you'll see the contents then of unit one, from the focus period introductory materials, ancient warriors, to finally the Beowulf text itself. Let's turn to page 12, 13, 14, and 15. The first thing I want to point out, and again, you're annotating your actual textbook. You're getting to write in the book, which is terrific practice for you as you get ready for your university college study. The first thing I want to point out is your timeline down at the bottom of the page that begins with 750, which is the time period we'll be working with, often referred to as the Anglo-Saxon period, through 1066. And notice that you have a, a variety of dates there at the bottom of the page. You'll just want to pay attention with some pictures as well available. If about any of those dates and events you're unfamiliar, obviously it makes sense to do some work for yourself. Let's begin now on page 12. And let's do some reading, let's do some annotative work, starting with voices of the period. We've got three of them there. The first one is the great B, the author of A History of the English Church and People. He says it this way. It seems to me that the life of man on earth is like the swift flight of a single sparrow through the banqueting hall where you are sitting at dinner on a winter's day with your captains and counselors. Wow. Pause for a moment right off to the side. Life is like a bird that has flown into the place where you're eating. Now, obviously, we're not talking about a small contained room, are we? We're talking, of course, about a large hall. In the midst, to continue now with B, there is a comforting fire to warm the hall. Outside, the storms of winter rain and snow are raging. This sparrow flies swiftly in through one window of the hall and out through another. While he's inside, the bird is safe from winter storms, but after a few moments of comfort, he vanishes from sight into the wintry world from which he came. So man appears on earth for a little while. But of what went before this life or what follows, we know nothing. Now, I want to begin with the second line of B, real quickly at 2B. Notice we're told that the life of man, and by the way, notice man here means all humans, although B himself was obviously talking in a patriarchal perspective about primarily men, but if pushed, B would have said this is true for men as well as for women. It's notice the word like. We want to circle that word. Of course, the comparison using like as is what we call a simile. In other words, life is like a bird that flies into a room where people are warm and celebrating and eating and enjoying, and then out the other side, the bird goes, and he says, that's pretty much what our life is like. Let's go to the second reading. Um, this one is from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, AD 878. This year, about midwinter, after 12th night, the Danish army stole out to Chippenham, and rode over the land of the West Saxons, where they settled and drove many of the people over sea. And of the rest, the greatest part, they rode down and subdued to their will, all but Alfred the king, a time of contest, a time of fighting, right? And then the third one is William the Conqueror setting foot on English soil in 1066. You want to circle that date. 1066 will be the conclusion of our focus period of 750 to 1066. He says, I have taken England with both my hands. Now let's go through really quickly a history of the period. I'll read, you read with me, following along, okay? And again, making notes for information that may end up, for example, on, a, on, a, on an exam. In the beginning. From the Roman invasion of Britain to 55 BC to the Norman conquest of 1100 years later, the Britons were beset and the eventual nation was shaped by invaders. In other words, Britain or England is defined by invasions, one after another. They came to conquer and stayed to build in the first century AD. The Romans drove the original inhabitants of Britain into the north, Scotland, and west, Wales, of the island. 
You'll, of course, look to page 13 there to see your map as well. The Romans brought with them their well-ordered civilization of roads and schools, of towns and trade, dividing Britain into two provinces. They established a capital at London and another at what would become York to the north. What a with a population of about two million people, Roman Britain thrived until the fifth century. The Anglo-Saxon arrival. Then, in AD 449, you want to circle that date, after the last Roman troops had been summoned home to defend Rome against the barbarian invaders, a group of Germanic tribes, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jews, crossed the North Sea and occupied the island the Romans had called Albion. Britons were pushed to the west as Anglo-Saxons established kingdoms along the coasts and in the river valleys. Albion became Angleland, which became England. By the beginning of the 8th century, people would think of themselves as, quote, the nation of the English, end quote. Each successive wave of invaders brought its distinctive culture, including its language, as the different groups fought and eventually united to form a single nation their languages, too, conflicted and eventually combined. A peaceful invasion. The period between the fall of the Roman Empire at the end of the 5th century and the year 1000 is sometimes called the Dark Ages. So let's circle that term in your, in your book. A time of great social, political, and economic turmoil in Europe. Notice the Dark Ages, three things, great social, political, economic turmoil in Europe. It was a period when the strongest surviving institution was the Roman Catholic Church. You want to underline, circle that term, right? In 8597, the Roman cleric Augustine arrived in Anglo-Saxon Britain intent on converting the pagan English to Christianity. Along with Celtic missionaries from Ireland, the Christian clergy spread their faith in England, founding monasteries as centers of religious life. I'm now on to page 14. By the end of the 7th century, England was a leader of scholarship in Europe. Back to page 13, the integration of knowledge and ideas. Notice your map here, right? As well as some comments on the side there. Romans invaded in 55 BC to AD 43. And then you'll see some words that are actually going to be brought in, right? Wall from volume as so on, okay? Let's go back now to page 14, the Venerable Bede. In Northumbria especially, scholars such as Bede wrote histories and other scholarly works. It was in this atmosphere that works such as Beowulf were written. Bede, a learned monk, wrote a history of the English church and people, making an important stage, marking an important stage in England's developing sense of itself as an island nation. With his knowledge of Latin and history, Bede was not interested in merely telling the story of a single clan's mead hall or drinking hall. The reader can sense how the island in the ocean, quote unquote, that he describes is on its way to becoming a nation, a place that is as much a product of its history as of its geography. Bede's history is included in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, seven documents that are a major source of information on early English history created between the 9th and 12th centuries and recorded by monks in different monasteries. The Chronicle gives an account of events year by year, beginning with Caesar's invasion of Britain. The next heading, invasion of the Vikings. In the 8th century, the Vikings arrived from what is now Denmark. And about a hundred, for about 100 years, they raided and looted the towns and monasteries of the Northeast, but eventually they settled that area. In 871, circle the date, when the Vikings tried to overrun the rest of the island, they were stopped by Alfred the Great, now considered the first king of England. Alfred the Great, the first king of England. Next heading, William the Conqueror. The last successful invasion of England occurred in 1066. You want to, you want to circle that date? It's an important one. When Francis William... Duke of Normandy, claim and won the throne. Known as William the Conqueror, he was crowned King of England on December 25th, 1066. William brought his court and his language, the French language, to the country he seized. 
For some time, England was a bilingual country. Let's circle the word bilingual and note that it means you can speak two languages of conquerors and conquered. The Normans brought more than their language to the island. The Normans, early French. They also solidified a form of government, social order, and land tenure called feudalism. Let's circle that word and let's go now to the next heading of feudal world. In the centuries between the Germanic invasions and the dawn of the modern world, England changed from a place of warrior bands and invading tribes to a country ruled by a king, nobles, and bishops. By the year 1000, English kings controlled the entire island with the rulers of Wales and Scotland paying them homage. In the feudal system, the king reigned from the top of a pyramid of power in which he granted land to nobles, who in exchange owed him loyalty and military service. The nobles in turn granted land to knights on the same terms. At the base of the pyramid were the peasants, called villains or serfs, who worked the land controlled by the knights. Our next uh, um, and final heading, the rise of towns. At the same time, towns such as Jovek, today's York, were becoming thriving centers of international trade with several thousand households. Merchants, traders, and artisans or crafts workers formed a new middle class, let's circle that term middle class, ranked between nobles and peasants. This class gained power in medieval towns with merchants and artisans forming associations called guilds. We want to circle that term as well. Over time, the rise of towns and expansion of trade would change feudalism. Let's go to page 15 now quickly. Literature of the focus period. Two of the selections in this unit were written during the focus period and reflect the hopes and fears of the people of the time. The selections also reflect society's loyalty to valiant warriors and its desire for an almost Superman hero. Okay. We're going to work with Beowulf and the Battle of Malden, which uh, both will uh, be um, credited to uh, Burton Rothwell. Connections across time to finish. Society's need for an interest in heroism and leadership have in no way diminished since the focus period. These ideas have continued to influence writers, speakers, commentators throughout the centuries. So we're going to look at Richard Lovelace's poem, To Lucaste on Going to the Wars, Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade, Mary Borden's The Song of the Mud, and Wilfred Owen's famous Dulce et Decorum Est. As well, we'll look at some um, stuff from the BBC, um, How Did Harry Patch Become an Unlikely World War I Hero, Zadie Smith's Accidental Hero, Stephen Riker's The New Psychology of Leadership, Queen Elizabeth's Speech Before Her Troops, Gandhi's Defending Nonviolent Resistance, and Thrasydice's Thr uh, um, um, Funeral Oration by Pericles. All right, let's turn now um, to page 16, and we're ready for our study of Babel. Thank you.